Hi, I'm Antonio Trumbo with optometrystudents.com, and today I'm happy to be here with Dr. Kenneth Cafrida, uh, an expert in binocular vision with countless years of experience and achievements. Um, I'm not certain I like the part about countless years, but I'll accept it because it's true. Um, I guess I'll start off by saying a little bit about my background on how I got into optometry. <laughs> well, I wanted to be a jazz musician, but my father said no. So my town, all the good little Italian boys, and only boys, because it was not co-ed, went to Seton Hall University, where I got my bachelor's degree in 1969, <laughs> then went on to optometry school at the sort of suggestion of my optometrist. In mid-year, about mid, mid-year, second or third year of optometry school, I realized that I really wanted to get into optometry education, in particular research. Uh, I had a lot of questions. And most of the professors couldn't answer my questions adequately in the clinic, in particular. So that made me forge ahead and go get my Ph.D. at the University of California in Berkeley, where I finished in 1977. Then I spent a year in Alabama at the University of Alabama School of Optometry. Beautiful place. Just wasn't home for me. <laughs> and there, therefore, I came back to New York, New Jersey area. And since 1979, I've been a faculty member at SUNY College of Optometry. One of, uh, in terms of some accomplishments, I mean, um, one of the things I look at is, as a researcher, a clinical researcher, is what contributions have I made to the scientific world and uh, an optometric world uh, as well. And I've published over 250 papers, six books, and one teaching manual. So I look upon that as a, as a good contribution or legacy uh, in various areas, uh, areas like accommodation, myopia, brain injury, normal and abnormal line movements, um, and things of that sort. One of the things I sort of insisted upon doing when I uh, got established at SUNY was to make sure I saw patients throughout my career, which I've done for about a half day or so each week in the eye movement clinic and the subspecialty area of, of um, auditory feedback, auditory bowel feedback, where we see patients uh, with nystagmus and other oculomotor abnormalities such as brain injury patients and things like that. So these are basically the hardest patients that people inside the school and outside the school in the area of binocular vision sort of don't know what to do with. So they send it to us. Uh, I work in conjunction with Barry Tannen uh, for the past 25 years or so. We've seen several hundred patients with nystagmus in which typically they're told we can't do anything about it by most outside practitioners, be it optometrists or ophthalmologists, when in fact we could do some things about it. One's vision training, one's contact lenses, one is teaching them some proprioceptive techniques uh, and the like. And what we do that's unique there is use oculomotor auditory about feedback so they hear the rise move. I think those are some of the main things that I've been doing. Um, I have uh, several graduate students, probably eight or ten PhD students, eight or ten postdoctoral fellows, about thirty or so master students. Um, I've been involved as a co-director and director of a T35 federal grant for the past twenty-five or so years. When I I was lucky, because in when I entered optometry school in 1969, it was the beginning of what I'll call modern optometry. So it was the beginning of optometry students learning about ocular disease to, in detail, not in a superficial manner, as well as beginning to learn about diagnostic drugs. We've had, so we've had diagnostic drugs, took about 20 years, and about another 15 or 20 years to get therapeutic drugs. Uh, I think it's wonderful because it allows us to, to um, practice what I've talked to you earlier about uh, many times in class and privately about what I consider full-scope optometry. I don't consider full-scope optometry doing only ocular disease. The really good, the really smart, the really educated optometrist should be able to handle all the areas of optometry. Low vision, vision therapy, ocular disease, contact lenses, and primary care. In order to be good as an optometrist, you really have to be good in primary care because the baseline for everything you do is the distance and their refraction and related kind of findings. If you don't have a good refract refraction, you can never move on to do a good job. So every optometrist, I think, should be capable enough
to handle at least 80 to 90 percent of the patients in each of those categories, subspecialty areas that I just mentioned, with the remaining 15, 10 percent being the really harder patients where they might want to go to a specialist in contact lenses, low vision, etc. Someone who's really in what I call an ocular disease maven, really good in it, and that's what they mainly see. But I think every optometrist should be able to see all kinds of patients and solve 85% of the harder patients' problems with the other 10-15% going elsewhere. Mm -hmm. The question is, where is optometry going? And my answer is I'm not certain. Um, one of the things that a lot of people are worried about, uh, and there's a lot of diverse opinions about this, is in the past couple of years, and for the next couple of years, um, there are sort of four or five new schools either just open or will be opening. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that we have the uh, enough faculty and good enough faculty to teach them uh, appropriately. I mean, there's always someone who could teach a course, mm -hmm. but the All question right. is who could teach it at a pretty high level yeah. that the student needs to really render good patient care and also pass the boards, practical things like passing boards. So um, it's a little problematic and we'll see in 10 years where this all goes. Clearly, one of the things that a lot of people complain about, especially my age, 64, is that we see optometry not widening in its scope, but biasing in its scope, getting away from vision therapy, low vision, and even being able to do a good refraction. A lot of students, in many of the schools, can't do a really good refraction. Now that sounds like heresy, and you can't believe it, but it's absolutely true. So you uh, talk, talked about practicing full scope optometry, being able to practice full scope. What is one area of optometry do you think that needs more attention uh, now than maybe in before, or just in general? Just because it's an area that I do a lot of work in and that I love, but it's an area that patients need a lot of help and there's very few people, very few practitioners who can do it, and that's the area of brain injury in particular traumatic brain injury. It certainly has received a phenomenal amount of attention given the recent uh, wars in Iraq and Afghanistan as well as all the attention with sports injuries and concussions. Um, I tell my students and other doctors that brain injury patients are made for optometrists. There's no one, and I really mean absolutely no one, who can handle the vision problems of patients with traumatic brain injury as well as other related dysfunctions such as stroke, uh, encephalopathy, vestibular dysfunctions, etc., as well as an optometrist. That doesn't mean other people aren't needed to handle the case, such as a physiatrist, such as a neurologist, such as a neuro-ophthalmologist, occupational therapist, physical therapist, etc. But the prime person, and really the only person, who knows the most and can handle these patients the most is the optometrist. Ophthalmology, um, ophthalmology is involved with one inch of the visual system, the eyeball. So they, they understand seeing but not vision. Mm -hmm. And their visual system extends past that one inch, 25 millimeter eyeball. And that's not their forte, but it certainly is the forte of the optometrist. So various studies, ours at SUNY as well as in the VA hospitals, about 90%, it's almost all, of the patients with TBI that come to a clinic and have some visual problem will have an oculomotor problem of some kind, a virginal problem, a virgin's problem, accommodator problem, strabismus, or CN palsy, paresis. So when you think about that, it's almost every patient that you will see that has a symptom, not every patient with TBI, but those that have a visual symptom will have an oculomotor problem, 90%. So I tell people, if you see such a patient and they don't have an oculomotor problem, well, either they're lucky or you missed it. Mm -hmm. And these oculomotor problems are really easy to handle. They're, they involve basic vision therapy plus a few other things. So. And we have organizations in optometry to sort of promote this. Mm -hmm. We have the NORA, Neurooptometric Rehabilitation Foundation, our group. We have uh, CLVD, we have OEP, there's other organizations that a lot of optometrists don't know about but should. NABIS is one of them. There's a few other ones outside that uh, we should all know more about.
It's the best way to kind of get because it's it seems like it's a small facet. It's growing, like you said, but it's small right now. Is that a good way to for students like myself who we're not really exposed to that much right now, but to get more involved, well, more educated on it? Well, and one of the ways is to go to different meetings, the groups that I just told you about would be one possibility. One is what we've done at SUNY and a couple of the optometry colleges. Uh, that has formed sort of a little student group of neuro-optometric rehabilitation, student liaison with the neuro organization. And we meet once a week, once a month here at SUNY and talk about papers. Um, it's beginning to intrude into our curriculum at the college in the third year with about eight hours or so in this area. Um, bottom line is you'll, you can get it when you come out of the college, graduate. Um, I think there's a couple books that are available that you can read, and there's some papers that I've written as well as other people. Uh, why don't we just uh, talk a little bit about vision rehabilitation and some of the underlying mechanisms um, involved in it. Um, in terms of um, vision therapy or vision rehabilitation or whatever word you like to use, uh, there's two underlying mechanisms, and these are mechanisms not invented by optometry, but invented by motor learning people, by psychi psychology, by basic researchers and some clinical research, and neurophysiologists. These basic tenets are one, perceptual learning, and two, motor learning, in our case, oculomotor learning. So the first one, perceptual learning, just says that if I practice <laughs> a repetitive task, let's say of discriminating a blurry from a non-blurry target, a double from a single target, or things like this. If I practice it over and over again, I'll get better. At least 30% better, if not more. And this has been around for decades, and, been, and done by all sorts of neurophysiologists and physiologists and whatnot, not optometry. So if I practice some task like that, say blur discrimination, <laughs> position discrimination, and all that, I'm going to get a whole lot better. That's basically what we do mainly in amblyopia therapy. Also for virgins and accommodation therapy, when the person has to interpret the blur or interpret the disparate diplopic images. They're perceiving them and then learning to do something with it. And the learning to do something with it is the second part, the motor learning or oculomotor learning. <laughs> oculomotor learning is similar. Basically, if I do the same motor task, but not sensory perceptual task, over and over and over again, I'm going to get a whole lot better at it. So just think of when we do flippers for accommodative training, lens flippers or prism flippers for virgins training, etc. What are we doing? We're getting the person to appreciate, say, blur with the lens flippers, and then the motor aspect to make the target clear. So all of our vision therapy, vision rehabilitation, whatever word you like to use, has solid underlying neurophysiological uh, principles, that is perceptual motor learning. One of the best studies done years ago, 1965 or 70, showed that the functional cure could be 77 percent in children and young adults doing strabismus therapy. I'm not cosmetic, but functional cure, meaning that I, I'm, I have single vision almost all the time, stereo acuity, etc. So there's a long history vision therapy and the under, underpinnings really go back to neuroscience. Uh, and the underpinnings really go back to the father of orthoptics who, you might be surprised, wasn't an optometrist but actually was an ophthalmologist, world famous ophthalmologist, 1879 or so in France, Javal, when I be, was still an optometry student. I sat on the stairs of Mass College of Optometry and with an ophthalmologist who I was friendly with. He taught me retinal, uh, the retinal diseases. And one of the things he said was, well, I don't know if vision therapy really works, but maybe just give the kid a lollipop, and that'll be just as good, the positive reinforcement. And I, that was my inroad into vision therapy. And uh, clearly, the lollipop doesn't work. Vision training does. So on behalf of OptometrySTudents.com, I'd like to thank Dr. Kafrida for sharing his wisdom and taking the time to um, give us all his clinical pearls. Well, thank you for having me. Thank yeah. both of you. Bye now.